Okay, everybody, welcome back. This is uh, post lunch, so let's see how much energy we have left. Um, so, what you're looking at in front of you is a Ubuntu Linux box, and it is installed in a Parallels window. I believe that Parallels is a well. It's, it, I know it is a virtual machine software. I believe that the, they recently came out with a version for the Windows machine. I'm not sure. This is running on the Mac, uh, but um, you see where the interface actually looks just like. Uh, well, I'll just say it looks just like. It's sort of resembling the Windows 7 actually kind of kind of a look. But you know we have a little sidebar here. You know and you can put applications here, and it's all GUI based. So if you're looking for a really nice Linux build, Ubuntu. I believe this is 10 point something. I put a video out. Um, it's on YouTube. I'll put the link in the class where you can download this. Uh, you can download the ISO file. You can install it. Uh, or you can boot your system. So you stick the disk in and you make sure you're booting from the CD-ROM drive and you boot your system into the CD-ROM or the DVD, whichever happens to be what you burned it to. And uh, you don't have to install anything on your system. You can do it. It's called a live disk. Um, in fact, if you go to uh, Ubuntu, let me just look real quick. Uh, I'll just do a Google search here. Download Download Xcode now. How about Ubuntu? Ubuntu. You don't need the server. You just need the uh, regular one. If you this is if you don't have a MacBook or if you don't have a Linux build of some sort. You download Ubuntu. Oh yeah, okay. So it's eleven version eleven is the newest. I think believe this is this is probably what I have. Um, it gives you options when you create, so you can download, burn your CD, you can create a bootable USB stick or bootable USB drive, actually. It's probably one of the easiest installs you'll ever do for an operating system. You can install it uh, on a USB stick, you can run it from a CD, run it from a USB stick. Uh, highly recommend this because uh, you know it gives you that nice little graphical user interface here. And here I'll just click in this window real quick. You've got um, Firefox. This is all stuff that was loaded by default, actually. Um, I put uh, Eclipse on here, and I actually have the Android um, operating. I have the Android toolkit and everything running from here as well. So you can see it's it's, it's very powerful, actually. Um, but here we use a here's the here's a little web interface. So the, the screen's kind of small because my window is small, but you can make this full screen as well. So if you're looking for a nice uh, Unix build, that might be a good choice for you. And uh, actually. I'm gonna exit out. I'm gonna close this because I don't really need it. And you might you might enjoy the uh, new interface too, the Grom interface. So uh, I gotta shut down. Yep, shut you down. I believe that tomorrow will be. I'll I'll, I'll use the Ubuntu system tomorrow. So tonight, if you want to, you could uh, you could essentially download, uh, create your download the ISO image, create the CD or the DVD, and get it ready and just stick it in your computer and boot it up. You can test out Ubuntu. Um, because as we go through the course, I'm going to be giving it, you know, giving you a lot more commands outside of the first lecture. So, first lecture has got some commands in there that I've been using um, at the terminal prompt, but you might want to start experimenting with some of this as well. So, all right, so I'm going to finish lecture number one, and then I'm going to go over some assignments for you, and then we can see what we've got in store. Uh, so this is a continuation of the lecture that we uh, stopped before lunch. And I believe I was talking about uh, file I/O or directory. I was actually redirecting uh, file output. Uh, so we've already covered the basic manual stuff, the conventions, the concept of the directories, uh, recursive directories, absolute versus relative path. For those of you who weren't here before lunch, uh, the quota, uh, finding out disk space, things of that nature, poking around, looking at uh, hard drive space, talking about hard drives, talking about directory structures. Uh, permissions, the concept of the change mod and the change owner. Um, I've got another lecture that's going to come into a lot more detail with these commands and show you a lot more of the options. This is basically an overview or an introduction to the concepts. Uh, basically explaining to you, you know, obviously the file permissions that are different on a Unix system than they would be on a Windows system, stuff like that. And um, who am I? You know, the command you can type in. Um, in fact, I wonder if who am I actually works on. Uh, I'm pretty sure it does, but let's just take a look here real quick. Uh, who am I? Yep, it does. Be a hacker. Okay. I don't know if I tried that before. 
But, uh, so if you have a MacBook, actually, though, I've been demonstrating on the terminal window, and that's all you need for this course, actually. Uh, if you don't have a MacBook, then you'll have to install Ubuntu or something, but yeah. Okay, um, what is my group, stuff like that, password, changing your password, we covered that. Uh, top, giving us a refreshing look at uh, what's going on in terms of the running processes that are on the system, and that actually gives us a live view. So top actually is different than running, you know, PS, we've discovered, uh, shows us the running processes. If, uh, you know, if I, if I type in top, what I'm getting is a, and you can see at the top it's refreshing. It's actually showing me currently what's going on. Um, so it's what, which processes are running, what's going on in terms of the CPU utilization, how many threads are running, stuff like that. So I um, wasn't quite sure if I had pointed out that this is a kind of a live runtime. And, you know, you can see, you can type in uh, uptime and see uh, how long the system's been running. It looks like about four hours and 13 minutes so far. Uh, so, all right, so that was the review. Uh, PS, processes. Uh, running in foreground and background um, processes as well, using the ampersand. And I didn't actually demonstrate that before lunch, but uh, it's just a matter of putting in that ampersand at the end. So if I were to come back to my terminal window, if I were to type in ls with an ampersand next to it, well, it's sort of running it in the background, but there's nothing really to run. But it shows me right here, actually, that this process started, and it was process 1 and process ID, excuse me, process ID was 32, 32 37, and if I wanted to, you know, it's, it's running, I guess, right now, so I can go kill, kill 32, 37, and it would kill the process, and then now it says done. But it was done anyway. There was nothing to kill because ls just lists out the directory information. So it wasn't, it wasn't really doing anything. If I had, like, run nano in the background or something, uh, the reason why we're running it in the background is because we don't want the foreground. We don't want the, the output here. So if I typed in nano and then with the ampersand, you see nano is running right now, actually. In fact, if I type in nano in the foreground, nano looks like that. But we don't see that because it's running in the background. So we're missing out on that. Uh, but now that's actually running. So if I type in PS, I can see nano right here. And nano is process number 3241. And the process system, the process numbering is actually kind of interesting. Um, not only is it telling you how much time has been up, but what command is running. And um, this will increment, you know, as I, it's still running. So it's still, still, so. The, the process numbers, the process IDs, are all incremental. And uh, I'm going to have an entire lecture on the boot system, where the kernel loads up and it loads in it. And we start out with a process number one. And we process, we create processes from the user level. Because um, in Unix, we have, you know, like I said, they call it a dual mode kind of operating system, where we have kernel mode and user mode. And we have processes that are assigned priority for users and processes that are controlled by the kernel. And all of the kernel processes are lower in number. Um, and so by the time we get the user mode, it's just some arbitrary number that we're starting with. And each process, excuse me, each program that we run runs in the abstraction of a process. And the process numbers aren't repeated, so they're just incremented. So, you know, you might have 3,241 3, here, but, uh, you know, another half hour from now, I'm probably going to have 6,000 something if I keep running stuff, you know. Depends on how many processes I'm running, but uh, here if I type in kill 3241, now it's actually going to kill it because it is running, it was running in the background. If I type in PS, I'm going to say, oh, it's done. 3241 is no longer in the system, but 3217 is, and that's this bash shell. Bash is running. So if I go like this, and I'm running now this one, and I go, actually, I wonder if this one's in here. Yep, that one's in here too. So now I got two shells running. So if I go bash again, now I got three shells running, four shells running. So if I go PS, I should see all these shells running, which I do. So now I can see I've got one, two, three, four shells running. <laughs> so it's so taking up a lot of space actually, uh, because each one of them is allocated the same amount of space, uh, which means. I could theoretically have four simultaneous users going on in all of those shells that are running. And uh, if so, eventually, if I leave all these shells open, eventually what's going to happen is I'm going to, you know, my system's going to start running slowly. And I'm not going to have as much processor power because I've got all these processes that are running that really aren't doing anything. 
So as uh, another sort of tidbit to tell you is you always want to exit, exit out of the shells. So when you tell that into a server and you log in and you just leave it, some of the, some of the Telnet programs actually automatically log you out, which is nice, but not all of them do that. So not a bad habit to get into is just type the word exit, type the word exit, <laughs> exit again, you know, exit out of all those shells and all that stuff you're doing. Because, uh, oops, if I spell it right, I think I'm back out. Yeah, there we go. So if I exit out of the main shell, it's going to tell me process completed. You know, so, so it means that this isn't even running anymore, which means I can't type anything. So another little thing about the shell windows as well is, uh, is this shell window and that shell window are two separate environments. So over here, if I, uh, let me open up another one because I exited out of that one. If I typed in, uh, you know, sh, I typed in uh, bash, let me run bash again, sh again, and c shell. Okay, so I got all those shells loaded over here. If I go ps over here, and I go, oh, look at all those shells running over here, all right? This is a session going on. I go open up another fresh window and I type in ps. What do I see? I see all the same stuff going on. It's a totally different window. So if I shut this window here, well, the BSD system will automatically end all of these for me automatically. But that's a feature of the BSD Unix. So if I close this window here without exiting out of anything, I just close the window. And if I type in PS over here, it should be cleared out, which it is. But what I'm trying to tell you is like sometimes when you're telling it into a Unix system, you start logging in, logging in, logging in, do that like a couple hundred times or something like that. Or, you know, if it's a Unix system, especially an internet system. Uh, and it doesn't have an auto log out feature when you close that terminal window. You're eating up resources. You got stuff open that's still open. And believe it or not, you can t actually kind of tell. All you have to do is run PS, run processes, and see what's running. And then log in again and see what's running. And all the same stuff that you had last time, the session before that, the session before that. If it's still all running, you know it's not auto logging you out. So hopefully, uh, you know you'll be working in an environment that will auto log out, so you don't have to worry about it. So. All right, so that was uh, running uh, running things in the background using the ampersand symbol. Uh, you can run mo multiple things in the background, actually. You get returned to a prompt. So if you have, like, a, I know you probably don't want to run nano in the background because that's the user interface to it, but like a backup script or a maintenance or something, uh, you know, as a, as a system administrator, you might want to run that in the background. Um, Here's another one. Uh, didn't, dem didn't demonstrate it, but the asterisk works as a wildcard as well. So we're looking at that. And when you talked about Nano, we talked about Pico. We, I think we probably ended right here, actually. Standard input and standard output. And I pointed out that typo in the slide, I hope, for you, uh, which I haven't fixed yet. So long story short, uh, the redirectional, and we I looked at this, actually. I showed you an example of this right before the break, and this is where we ended. Um, to redirect the output, I wanted to say a few more things about this, however. Um, you know, sending something to a file is great, but we don't normally just want to do that. Instead, we want to like take the output of something and send it to something else and use it like for a program. And the interesting thing is here is it just, just redirects output. So we can redirect output. We can send, as an example, a list, and we can string it together with three or four different things. I can go like a ls minus l to a file and then nano the file or something. So I can open up the file after I send it to it. And when I start stringing it together, you'll find that the pipe command actually is the stream. But this isn't really, this is working with the stream and you can combine the arrows with pipe. Uh, and the pipe symbol actually looks different. It, uh, it's this one here. It looks like that. That's a pipe. Uh, these, are the, these are the directional operators as we've seen. The two appends, the single ones, don't append, they overwrite. And this one here is used as a pipe. And what does a pipe do? Well, just like a pipe, like a plumbing pipe, it hooks things together. So it's like plumbing, actually. You take the output of some program and you can input it into another program. So you can pipe, essentially. Connect, connect the uh, programs together. And so one of your assignments, when we'll go over the assignments before you leave today, um, we'll have you write a bunch of commands that redirect and pipe. And what you're doing is you're just writing long stuff uh, on the command line that all works together. So it makes it more automated. And sure, yeah, you can do it manually. But sometimes you can't, actually. I mean, sometimes you can't capture things manually, um, you know, because it's too much work. So sometimes 
the logic of the operation of what you're doing, especially like for backup, as an example, works a lot better when it's uh, strung together instead of done after the fact. Um, so that was the uh, directional arrows. The input direction, redirection, I should say, input can uh, be given a command from the file instead of typing it from the screen. And here's one, it's a cat. So, so typing it on the screen would be, you know, impractical, but if we do cat, we do cat program input, and then we go to my command. So this command takes a series. So it starts with a command cat, or concatenate, actually, uh, which prints a file to the screen. Actually, well, you can concatenate as well, but it's going to print the file to the screen. And uh, program input is printed to standard output, uh, which is redirected to the command my command. So. If we did this, we could take, uh, you know, some program input that we're printing to the screen, send it to this command, like nano or something, and we can pretty much automate the opening and the editing of a file, as an example. And going back to what I was saying before, we use the, you know, things like nano and bi and stuff like that because they're text command line tools. We don't want to, like, mix this with a GUI. It's really hard to mix something like this with a GUI. And most of your GUI applications actually have command line interfaces to them. So even your sophisticated email programs, they all have command line interfaces. Well, the Unix ones do, because they they know you're going to want to you know do it from a Unix command prompt, and they're not you know I was going to want to use the GUI for it. Um, so here's a couple more. Um, I can run that, but I, I think you could probably figure out what it's doing actually. There's a couple more. I could probably run these, but you can probably figure out what it's doing as well. Performing a normal redirection. So it will not redirect uh, standard error. So in Bash, this can be accomplished with a 2. So if you go back to here for a second and go, well, we really have a numbering system. So we have a 0, a 1, and a 2. Because everything you know in C starts out with 0, like arrays and stuff like that. I'm going to start counting numbers with 0. So 0, 1, and 2. So we can actually just specify 2 for error. So we could use the shorthand instead of typing out S T D E R R and all that other stuff. But you can do that as well. Here's two with this little arrow. So it's accomplished by you know here. This is going to go to a file. So we're going to get whatever error would come out of there. Or you can merge standard error to standard output. The most popular way of doing it would be two with a you know arrow to run in the background to one. What's one? Well, that's standard output. So we have input, output, and error, 0, 1, and 2. So if we did that, actually, we would end up with, let's just run, L, let's just run ls, but I don't think we're going to get anything out of ls. Um, actually, here, let's just do this for a second. I'm trying to think, I probably should have put some commands on here, but um, actually, good question. Let's see if this, uh, let's see if I can generate an error somehow. Um, Let's get this on the screen. If I try to cat a file that doesn't exist, it should give me an error. All right, so cat uh, my file filing because I know that file doesn't exist. Uh, I'm not sure if this is actually going to give me an error or not. Yeah, so let's see what's in file one. It's going to say if I so if I cat out file one, it's going to say. File filing, uh, no such file or directory, <laughs> because this was the uh, the error message. So if I didn't didn't redirect the error standard error to that file one that I did, if I just took that out, I'm going to get this error message that shows up. It says cat file filing, no file or directory. So if you do this and you don't make an error, it doesn't write anything. So as an example, um, let's see. So, the touch is actually the touch actually creates a file. I just I just touched me, so I created a file called me actually. Uh, so if I cat out me, that works. And if I cat out, actually, let's just do it this way. But now if I now if I cat file name file one, it's empty because there was no error. So you can capture, it's an easy way to write a script, and we'll be writing some scripts actually in this class, and um, automatically send the output, any error that might exist, send it, and you know, maybe even email it to yourself or something.
Um, I don't know if I have Pico in here, actually. I don't know if I have, oh, no, I don't have Pine. Pico. Oh, I do have Pico, oh, Nano. Okay, Nano and Pico are kind of the same. Um, tomorrow I'm going to actually, uh, hopefully, have this set up so that I can uh, show you how to get applications. So we'll do an app get, we'll install the app, Aperture, uh, whatever it's called, the uh, utility to go out and get stuff on the internet. Um, in fact, I probably have it already on the Ubuntu. I probably have Pico on the Ubuntu, but I mean uh, Pine, which is an email program. So anyway, this one down here, oh, someone's, someone's phone. Uh, down here, the other one would be to merge the standard error to the standard output. Um, so it would go to the file, then it would also go to the output. So I'm pretty sure you can probably figure out how that one would work on your own as well. But it's kind of interesting to see see things demonstrated. Um, because that's how it should work, and then when you try it, you get an error message or something, and you go, wait a minute now. And I highly recommend trying this stuff out, actually, because uh, that's when you kind of remember certain things. And no, no one remembers all these little tricks and stuff until you actually have to use it. So until you start, it's like learning a programming language without programming. You know, you're not going to learn it, essentially. You're, gonna, you're never going to memorize programming language syntax. So here's our pipes here. So using a, a pipe operator, as I mentioned before, it is an operator. Um, it's that line. And uh, on my keyboard, it's actually in a funny place. On the MacBook, it's actually underneath the delete key, on the right-hand side of the keyboard. On Windows, it kind of looks like a line with a with a dot in the middle of it. It's like two pieces of line. That's um, That might actually be what you're using on your Windows box, uh, depending upon the way the keys are laid out. If it has a line, if it doesn't have a line, like you know, if it has a space in the middle, if it's a solid line, it doesn't matter. It's just the representation of that ASCII key is what you're using. So it can be linked together, so the pipe will link the standard output from one program to the standard input of another. Very helpful for searching files, as an example. So, so here's a, you'll have an assignment actually that will involve a searching in terms of uh, using grep and find. So a large majority of activities on the Unix system involve searching, finding stuff, because you know, you're in a command prompt. You, don't, you can't just bring up, well you can bring up a GUI. A file manager. In fact, there's a file manager in Ubuntu. In fact, uh, you know, it just looks just like Windows. You know, but if you're on a command prompt, you know, and you want to go command all the way, you know, you're going to use find and grep. So find is the utility to find files. Grep is the best utility ever written in Unix. <laughs> so it searches for patterns inside of files, and will return a line if it's found. It is the best utility ever invented because it's used in a lot of scripts. Go out and find this. Okay, so going back to spying on your users, you can actually just random because if everything's stored in text, which everything is stored in text in Unix, unless you've got a binary, it's just a search binary, and we have text strings in binary as well. They're always stored in a text representation, even in the hexadecimal kind of format. But long story short, um, you know, you really want to spy on your users. You can run a, a script not only that logs all of their information redirects all of the copies and redirects everything to log files and then search the log files for nasty words or something, you know. Like, I hate my boss or something. And then Grep will, Grep will do that for you. It'll search all of the, everything the user's done, email messages, Word document, everything. Search everything. Tell you how many times the person hates you. you know, so. I hate my system administrator or something, you know. Anyway, so here's an example down here <laughs> where we do a find, and this is on a you know some name and an output, some output file. So we're going to find something, and I'm going to leave this to you. I'm not going to demonstrate the find or the grab uh, because this is one of your assignments, uh, and I'll go over the assignments today as well. Packaging files. This is the interesting part. Um, you know, it wasn't until maybe Windows XP that it came with PKZip. In the old days, we actually had to download PKZip as a utility, and we had to zip our own files. Well, you know, in the in the Java, you know, we do the jar files. In Unix, we do the tar, the rar, all of the, and this is basically just the equivalents. It's just another way of our gzip, you know, one of the very common utilities to compress. And they all have their pros and cons. Some of them make smaller files than others. Some make files that are searchable. Some make files that aren't searchable. So uh, tar is actually are searchable. So. So for grep and for find and all of the other utilities. So when creating backups of files or transferring to other hosts, 
files must be packaged into larger files sometimes. So this basically doesn't compress, it just packages. So if you needed to, uh, ease of manipulation, transfers file, file management, stuff like that. So a lot of people tar up directories of like, you know, documents and things because it makes it easier to archive and to back it up. So in fact, you can easily run a tar utility to tar everything, back it up, and then, you, you know, runs at midnight or something or runs in the background during the day. Every 10 minutes, it backs everything up for you or something, you know. And it would be kind of stupid, but you could do it if you wanted to. So tar is a create or extract a packed file, and tar stands for tape archive, which is kind of coming from the tape days of the old, old, old Unix days. We don't have tape drives anymore. We don't have tapes. But in the old days, you had to tar it to put it on the tape. So it was a tape archive. Otherwise, it wouldn't fit on the tape, So, which is where that, where that sort of comes from. This is still the history and the overview of Unix. <laughs> so, <laughs> your history lesson, everything you ever wanted to know about tar. Uh, so, compressing files, here's the compressing part. So, this was a packaging, sort of like a, you know, just package. Okay, that's the concept. The compressing, uh, you can gain file space, you know, uh, at the expense of the CPU time to compress and decompress. And you can actually run things from compressed files, too. So, compressing works well for text files but not as well for binary with random data, such as float values and stuff. Uh, sometimes it can make a mistake, actually. Um, so compression algorithms and commands. Actually, Windows, you know, the zip file makes mistakes occasionally as well in terms of the algorithms that are used. Um, they're not 100%. So I always, every time I tar, so I, excuse me, every time I zip something up, even a PK zip, I always test it. I mean, people just do that naturally now. You just double click on it, make sure it actually opens. Because nine times out of ten it doesn't actually, you know. Once in a once in a while it just doesn't open, and then you deleted all of the original files, and your zip file doesn't work. So anyway, here's a compression algorithms and commands for bun zip, b and u, b zip, two b zip, well b zip, two, um, gun zip, z zip. Why are there so many? Well, because why are there so many shells? They all have like their pros and cons in terms of which one's bigger, which one's smaller, which one can you put archives inside of, you know, can you? And, and you, you know, you see a lot of Unix people that get carried away, you know, they got this and this and this all inside of a tar file. So like you get to one point and you, okay, I untarred it, oh, now we got a zip file, okay, and now I got a gzip, okay, now we got a bz zip, zip. now we got a, and then they, I think people just get carried away, but uh, there, there's some method to the madness, you know, there's a way of making it so that you can, bundle it all up, make it as small as possible. Why? Because it takes a long time to download it, to upload it. Um, and actually, believe it or not, there's things, there's utilities, like as an example here. I wonder if I have it on here, actually. Wget. Oh, no, we don't have it on here. I have to install a bunch of stuff, looks like. But, um, I have tar on here. Oh, I do have tar on here. Very good. Yep, I got I got those on there. See, some of this stuff actually comes standard, and some of it you have to install it. So, so Tar will create a compressed file for you, and here this is the the worst part is remembering and then using the same command switches when you untar it. <laughs> so usually when you uh, when you download new software, if you're not using an AppGet utility and you're just like downloading files, they'll tell you like in a README file, use this command to un untar it use this command to do this. It'll tell you the commands. Because it is kind of it is kind of sensitive. Um, so it creates a, this one here creates a compressed file named myfile.tar.gz containing all of the files in the directory directory. So this is a tar gz. So it packages it up and then it compresses it all in one. So instead of separating it out. See, um, pkz is all in one. We don't think about packaging it up and then compressing it. We just want to think about compressing it and packaging it up, right? So <laughs> it's the newer utilities like PKZip, as an example, just take and make it more automated. Um, here's a tar with a slightly different set of parameters where you're going to un uncompress it instead of compressing it this time, all directories and files inside of this and into the working directory, which is the current directory. So you could specify the directory, actually, where you want to install it to. And uh, connecting to other machines, this is the interesting one. And this one is a, I shouldn't say interesting, there's a secured shell, there's a Windows SSH client, an SSH uh, 
Telnet actually. There's a Telnet client and there's an FTP SSH client that's still out there, that still works. It's been open source for years it's, until it's broken. It's not bro ever broken. It works on practically every Windows version. Uh, but uh, and I, Mac actually has it built into the operating system. You can just SSH. Well, what is, it? What is SSH? It's a secure shell versus a restricted shell. So a secured shell is an encrypted remote login program that is secure to trust across non-secure networks. What does that mean? Well, okay, so if you're loading a, a Telnet session and it's not secure and you're sending a name and a password to a server to log in to upload your files to your web directory, you pretty much gave the world your login name and password and your directory and the host name, all the information they need to go in and change your website if they wanted to or do something with it. Uh, or you're sending email messages out, or you're doing something that is like sending sensitive information. Not that you'd send your social security number out or anything, but long story short, it's flowing across the pan. Oh, it's flowing across the Ethernet packets and IP packets, and it's all flowing freely with no encapsulation of any type of encryption. So SSH, a SSH, a secured shell, adds some some encryption to the transport. So it actually just puts another layer on there, adds a, another protocol to, and it has support for other protocols that you can actually restrict even further if you wanted to. But most of your web services won't allow an insecure, unsafe, open, unrestricted shell connection. They won't even allow it these days. In the old days, actually I shouldn't say that, there are some websites, there are some places where you can tell it into a server totally unrestricted, totally not, I mean just using like FTP, WS or something and just not using anything protection wise and uh, it usually happens is they're free server, you know, they don't care, there's no security on there, they, you know, because this costs money, this costs overhead, the, secure, the SSH client and the FTP client and uh, you know just so you know what I'm talking about, I can just, just load up Firefox here for a second. And uh, just go to Google. Mm. We got Putty. That's another uh, remote uh, remote logging kind of thing. Win, S Win SCF. There's also another one that's for university uh, usage, and it's it's called SSH client. SSH FTP. Um, and what are we talking about? This is terminal access. This is safe file transport. Instead of FTP or SFTP, so you're securely transferring files from point A to point B. What does that mean? Well, people can't come in and steal your packets, sniff your packets, look at your stuff, essentially. Take your stuff, copy your stuff. Because what if you were sending, you know, my business plan across from the wire to upload it to my server, uh, and I didn't want half the world looking at it? Because we all know there's you know bad people on the internet. There's bad, bad, bad bots on the internet too, and bots pick this stuff up all the time. So that's how people get you know, identity theft and stuff like that. You know, and if you're designing a website and you've got client services where people can upload stuff and download stuff, you want to make sure it's secure. So it's, it's stupid not to add it. I mean, there's so many different clients out there that work with you know secured interfaces. Uh, but the one I was thinking was actually, I think it's called Secure Shell. Secure Shell. Let me try this one. It's like Secure, it's like 32 bit or something like that, or SSH Shell Client. And this is the one here. This is a, it, it's all university supported uh, clients. In fact, a lot of university, here it is here actually, this is not too bad. SSH Secure Shell. Uh, so. If you're interested in, uh, let's just kind of zoom in a little bit so you can kind of see this. If you're interested in a long, been out for years, very reliable, nice little client, you can get it here or you can just type in SSH or secured client from a web browser. And uh, it's easy. It's just like, uh, it's like a little Windows program here. Actually. And most universities actually require this to log into Sun Systems or stuff. If they, if they have a Unix server, they're going to require an SSH connection. Because it's just safer. Okay, and if you're going to connect, you can do it from a command line. In fact, you can load in Linux. Well, that's actually that's a good thing. I wonder if I have it. Actually, I might even have it in here. Oops, I do. 
It's a command line utility. Uh, what I was just showing you a few minutes ago is if you were running from a Windows machine and you wanted to load a GUI to do it. Or actually, they have one for the Mac as well, a GUI for it. Uh, otherwise, what you're doing is you're just typing an SSH in and you're logging in, you know, providing your login information. It's um, sort of like the concept of Telnet. I mean, you can type in Telnet, and now I'm in a Telnet session. Or I can do FTP. Well, actually, I don't need that inside of Telnet, but I can go FTP. And uh, all of a sudden, now I can transport a file from one computer to another computer uh, by doing command line interface to it. And it's everything that you're familiar with with Windows, essentially. It's FTPing, telemetting, transporting, uh, downloading, uploading, everything you actually do. Uh, you can do from a, let me just exit then. Okay, you can, you can do from a command prompt in Linux. So. So as I was going to say, Windows didn't invent any of this stuff. Microsoft didn't invent any of this stuff. They're just pretty much piggybacking GUIs on top of the interface for a command line. So. Uh, yeah, user ID, host, at host, to, to log in. So copying files to remote hosts. So let's say you're doing some Linux admin. Well, let's go back to your website that you're uploading. And you're connecting and you want to send some files. Well, you can copy local files, L file to R file to remote file. So you can use a little utility here to actually copy from one machine to another machine to upload. If you didn't want to use it, like a, a client, FTP client or something like that, you don't actually have to do it that way. You can sync it. So RSYS R -S -Y -S, is uh, going to essentially be the utility to do that. And uh, so to the, the file, L file to R file on a remote computer. You go SCP left. I don't, actually don't have a connection to a remote computer. Otherwise, I'd demo this for you as well. But uh, I'm not connected to anything. So. And then I probably should get like a remote login or something just so we can transfer stuff back and forth and see it work. But uh, P reserves the modification time, the access time, the mode from the original one. You can copy the R file from the remote computer to the local computer. So you can go back and forth. So going back to my, uh, you know, write this fancy little backup program. So now we can tar everything, put it in a zip file, and then take our backup that we created and send it to another computer, to a safer backup computer or something. Or, you know, make a mirror copy of it. This can be excellent for mirroring copies or making copies of files. And uh, you wouldn't do this manually. You wouldn't sit here and type it all. You write a script. You write a script and run the script. And the script will do it for you. So running the command on a remote computer, you can do that as well. So commands can be executed on a remote host with SSH. So you're telling any or secure hosting to another machine, and you're running LS on the other machine, and it's as if you were on the other machine. So in uh, traditional universities, usually in uh, undergraduate programs, they have a Sun system. Or, I mean, Sun's pretty popular. It's cheap, and they, they give university discounts, too. Nobody, nobody uses HP UX. It's like companies use that, uh, business systems. For a university education, it's all Sun, mostly. Uh, and you, uh, you set up a Sun account, right? And you give everybody email addresses, you know, you know bhacker at itu.edu. And you set up, you know, give them a Telnet account, you know, SSH into it. And you can run GCC, and you can run Perl, and Python, PHP, all that stuff. You know that's installed on the server, and you're running it remotely. So you know your connection is kind of slow, but your processing is on the server. So you're usually given a home directory. Actually, you can put up a website there, make it public, create a public HTML directory from your home, put up a website, store files there, and do all sorts of things. So I'm hoping in the future ITU is going to have something like that. So, but the problem is, is each one of those little boxes is like ten or fifteen thousand dollars. A little pricey. For education, it's probably worth it if you're a huge university. So maybe when we get a little bigger, we're just too small to support that right now. So we could get one server, but what's the sense of one server? It doesn't do anything. <laughs> Usually, you don't buy just one sunbox. You, know, you got to buy like five sunboxes or something, or three or something. You know, one's just you know stupid. Might as well just buy a PC if you're going to do that. Uh, so we saw a print environment earlier today. What print environment was doing was just putting stuff out on the screen. And uh, here are my environments. We can view all the system variables by the command env, uh, which is very similar to print env. 
So depending upon the shell, the startup commands can be managed uh, with the files dot profile uh, for the bash and dot sr no, c c s h r c and c shell. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, the profile. Um, I don't know if mine's actually going to be set up. Not profile. Uh, no. In fact. Uh, no, actually, that's not going to work. Um, nope, mine's not actually set up. Uh, so, because the, the BSD system is a bit different than a native Unix system, and some of the stuff is left for GUI automation. So, when I hit that terminal, I can actually set, I can change my terminal preferences and things for my terminal window. In a regular old Unix environment, the way you get to the terminal and you open it is is through a, a boot up sequence and the boot up sequence is going to use these automated files and these automated files are going to set things for you and they're going to set your environment variables they're going to set your home directory they're going to set your name your prompt and stuff all that stuff when you type in uh, env and I'm actually kind of curious now to see if env works on here as well I know print env does yeah env is going to do the same thing as print env print environment or environment so it's a kind of a shortcut, env, that your login script is going to set all this stuff. And it's usually a profile, or it's usually uh, you know part of the script, depending upon the breed of Linux or Linux that you're running. So the uh, I don't believe I have a profile, and even though I'm running a bash, it's like an optional kind of thing, because the terminal window is essentially doing it for me. But it doesn't mean I can't create one. If I create one, it will, it will be run automatically. So here's some basic shell scripts because I've been talking about shell scripts and I've been mentioning you know how fun and easy they are and how you can do a backup with it and yada yada. Well, what does it really look like? And this kind of goes back to the concept of you know everything's a text file. So shell scripts are text files. So you load up a shell script and you basically tell Linux that it's a shell script and you give it you make it executable. If you make it executable, it runs just like a program, just like an exe file actually. Uh, so you can write all sorts of programs, and this is actually a form of programming, believe it or not. You'll be writing a couple of these shell scripts in your assignments. But um, according to the slide, you know, it might be helpful for a script of commands, you know, to run instead of typing them individually. Especially, you know, like, your system starts up every day, you go through this whole routine. Why not write a script? It'll do everything for you. So you can just have lunch all day, and your computer will do all the work for you in your absence. And you just have to tell it. Actually, you know, just tell that in and run the script. You don't even have to go to work. So we'll do all your work for you. There's people actually, believe it or not, that work like this. Not so much now as in the old days when nobody knew any of this, that they were doing this. But a lot of system admins, you know, just tell that in. Oh, it's in New York. Oh, no problem. Tell that in. Write some scripts. Send the scripts over to the server. And then, uh, oh, you got to get something done. Ah, yeah. Run the script. Actually, better yet, set up a daemon. Run in the background run the script for you, and then just email me the results. So, hey, did you run that report? Oh, yeah, here it is. <laughs> you know, it looks like you're doing a lot of work, but really the system's working for you. So, Which is how system administration should be. That's how life is. Uh, so many times it's helpful to just write a script of commands instead of writing them manually. Um, so we, what do we do here? We have this hash sign. We've got this exclamation point. And we said bin bash. Well, this just tells us that this is a script that's going to run into bash. Because not only can we write our own scripts, which are turned into programs, we can tell what we can tell you know Unix what shell to run it in. Do we want to run it in C shell, and we wrote the program in C. Let's say for example, or we want it in this case we're running it in bash. So the first sentence or the statement you know inside the script will list the shell to run the script in. It's interesting. Because this is very similar to what you see in Perl. What is Perl? Well, Perl is a programming language in itself. It's a scripting language. So when we look at scripting, we're actually going to look at Perl. You can learn Perl like in a day. It's not that hard of a language. In fact, PHP is like even easier. So Perl, PHP. Actually, Python's not too bad either. What are these? These are like traditional Unix scripting tools. Because here's what happened. You know, how much can you do with an autoexec.bat file? Batch files from a DOS perspective. Not much. Batch files, they just run commands. Alright, so basic shell scripting can just run commands. 
So if you write a Perl script, you're using a scripting language that's going to give you more flexibility. You can actually run, you know, you can create, you know, if-then statements and loops and flow control and put a little menu out there and tons of system utilities are actually written in Perl. And it's a text file and it looks, it starts out just like this, but instead of saying bin bad, to run it, run in a Perl interpreter, run it in a Python interpreter. You know, so running in PHP essentially, and so you're telling the, you know, runtime environment which interpreter this is written for, and it goes out and finds it and runs it. But Perl is nice because uh, it glues things together, and this is what scripts do. Scripts, it's not like programming an executable file, because when you program an executable file, you get a binary file and it doesn't change. It just sits there and you run it until you decide to change the program and then you recompile it. Scripts are more flexible because you can make them more dynamic. You can easily change the script, you know, without having to recompile anything. But not only that, but you can take a script and run pipe commands in there. So you can run Unix commands in there, and you can run programming language commands in there. So if you're writing the script in C, you get the best of both worlds. You get the command line interpreter and all the command prompts. Plus, you get the C language. So if you got Perl, you know, you got well, actually, Perl is used a lot with CGI interface. So what is the CGI interface? Well, it, it actually goes, you know, this is, falls in line with my history and overview of Unix CGI, Common Gateway Interface. No one's heard of that anymore because it was replaced with better utilities, like in the Java EE course, you know, the RMI, and servlets, and all this other stuff. But in the old days, and still happening today, by the way, web programmers, decided, wouldn't we like to run something on the server, you know, like old-fashioned server scripts like Perl? You can actually write a program that runs from your web browser that goes on and runs your backup for you. So, you can take your automated backup that you're getting paid by the hour to run or whatever, you can design a web page that goes in and you can select which backup file you want to write, you know, which utility script you want to run while you're at home or playing golf because you don't have to work, because your computer's going to work for you. And it goes through what's called a gateway. The gateway is a port that goes through the HTTP interface that connects the Unix server to the HTTP interface that allows you to come on in and run a command on the server, run your script. And uh, these commands are written in traditional style programming. They're written in C++, they're written in Perl, they're written in... Because what you're doing is you're starting a process you know, you're going into this gateway, into the Unix server, from the web server, and you're saying, run this program. And the program is going to do something system administration-wise or something. Or it's going to be a program that logs into a database and pulls information out or something. Can you ma possibly imagine the huge risks with that? <laughs> Which is why it's not used very much anymore, although it's still supported, and by default you get CGI with practically every web server you're doing. In fact, you'll even get it with hosting accounts. They'll give you a CGI. Usually, what you do is you create a CGI bin directory or it's created for you. You put all your executable files in there and you have limited, it's not as bad of a risk because you're limiting the exposure. You just don't want to open up your server and have everybody come in and run whatever they want. But that's what, sort of what you're doing when you allow a bot to come in through your CGI interface to run whatever it wants to run and then break whatever security you might actually have set up for whatever. Long story short, <laughs> scripts allow you to run stuff on the server through, and most of them actually support through web interfaces. Python, one of uh, Google's biggest biggest tools is Python. Half, of, half their scripts are written in that. So it's stuff that, you know, sounds like old Linux, Unix stuff, but it is modern day technology. We have Jython now actually, which is a Java interface to Python which has got huge, huge, huge Google support because what we're looking at is the ability to merge Java with Python. Python's a scripting language, Java's a programming language, and Java's everywhere, Java's taking over the world. Scripts are good. We still need the ability to write scripts, which is what Python good, is good with. So, anyway, I'm going to have an entire, this is just day number one introduction, I'm going to have an entire lecture on scripting, actually multiple lectures on scripting, probably not until the second weekend though. Uh, this hash sign here says that it will follow comment. It's not executable. So, follow. the following is a comment. It is not executable. But 
there's a when we talk about server scripting, the concept is that we're not downloading anything to the client. The client is just basically initializing something. It's saying run something, and then what we're running is actually running in a, on the server. And there's a lot, not too much control uh, from the client's perspective. Problem with uh, client side scripting, and we have that JavaScript, it's a perfect example of that. The code gets downloaded to the client. So if you've got a database login or something, you just lost your password, you just lost your database information, you just gave it to the client. So server scripting is nice because uh, it keeps things private and secure. It keeps it on the server. It doesn't allow it to get off the server. So, so it was, uh, I was talking about uh, those environment variables. We looked at home. We did an echo on a couple of different things. This is interesting. And this is it's going to put scripting and environment variables together because one of the big purposes for those environment variables is to hold variables. You know, like what's my home directory? What's my this? What's my name? Stuff like that. Well, we can also be into dry, float f, all those other variables, just like regular programming variables. So they're kept in the environment. And if they're kept in the environment, going back to the glue concept, we can have many different scripts all use the same stuff. And so now we have like a global multi-scripts running the same things, and we've just set one variable. It's like, you know, recording what pi is, you know, it's 3.14. Okay, so putting that in a variable and using it throughout your program every time you're saying if pi changes, you know, you want to go increase the precision a little bit, you just change one variable. So here you write one script, right, and you load it up and you change the username for 25,000 different users. <laughs> and you have one program that works for everybody, essentially. So environment variables help uh, make the work a little bit less for multiple, re you know, multiple versions of the same script essentially. You tie it to a variable, you change the variable to a different username and then voila you've got a program that works as a generic program for all of your users and not just one user. You're not rewriting a program for everybody. So by convention system variables are capitalized. So as we've seen before when I've been writing some of those uh, when echoing out home, uh, we've used capital capital letters for it and capital things. It's basically just a convention. It doesn't actually, you don't have to do it this way actually. Uh, but by convention, if you capitalize it, then we know it's an environment variable. So, like home is the location of home directory. Old password is actually in my environment as well. Location of the previous working directory. Or PWD, I'm sorry, not password. PWD is for directory. Uh, path, you know, location is to look inside for executable files. Same thing, same path concept as in the Windows system. So the system setting variables differ by the shell. A bash uses export, C shell uses set environment. Uh, so the export is what should be supported. Actually, I'm kind of interested. Kind of interested in seeing if I have that actually. Or if I'm running a uh, set environment. I think export, yeah, export works. Yeah. This is the set, set the variables themselves. Uh, we've already printed them. We've already gotten them by using env or print env. Um, print env is more generic. env is kind of the short version of it. Supported on bash, not supported in all shells. So. Uh, but here a C shell uses set env and then print env. So, uh, there's a little variation. So you have pretty much find out, and this you'll, you'll run into this problem as well. You're not running into a problem. You'll just see shells have different command names. So you'll be looking at one of the assignments and you'll be typing something in and it won't be working. Bad commander file name. What's wrong with that? Check the shell. Check to see what it's called in the shell. It might be env instead of, you know, print env or something. And print env might not be there. So I said, you know, all shells are not created equally. Although they're pretty compatible these days, they're still not all created equally. So some commands are slightly different. So uh, the user defined variables and scripts are lowercase. System develop, you know, system variables are uppercase, and we can tell the difference. So in here we have a my variable is equal to 10, you know, set my variable to 10, echo my variable, prints my variable. So if I said my variable is equal to 10, hello. Oops, yeah. Here we go. My variable. Oh, there you go. I said echo my variable. My variable. Oh, 
Okay, no, I didn't, I didn't show you this yet. Echo my variable. Get me the value instead of the name, 10. So we have this dollar sign, if you might have noticed. If I type in, you know, echo home, I'm going to get home because that's the variable. That's It's what I echoed, right? So if I want the value of home, I use the dollar sign. So if I go echo dollar sign home, I get my home. So a few minutes ago, I put in my variable is equal to 10. You can do that. And here's the interesting thing is that I close the window. Or actually, let's just do this. We'll open up another window. I go echo. Echo. My variable. Nothing. <laughs> There's no value set. So they go away. For that session, yeah. But you can make them stay, actually. You just add them to your environment. That's not added to the environment. That's, that's why I call it temporary variable. So if I wrote a script as an example and I said, you know, <coughs> into drive, float f, all these, you know, it's like a program, you know, and the program ended, all that stuff's not floating around in my environment. However, something like home, I want to keep home because I'm going to use it all the time. So I add it to the environment. So if I set the environment, you know, like set env. Oops, it's going to say bad commander file name. Because uh, it's going to be something different on this one. Uh, that's, that's a C shell. I'm running in a bash shell. So um, I can set the environment and I can set it permanently. So, is that permanent? Yeah, it is permanently. You know, reboot the computer, it's still there. Come back. Oh, of course you can. You can change all that stuff and you can add stuff to it. You know, make up your own stuff and put it in there. Because what, if you don't want to remember it, you just want to use it like home. You, know, you, know, you can essentially automate the system a little bit better. So what we did a few minutes ago here was just create it and then we printed it out. And this is temporary. This isn't adding anything to our environment. Some people argue and they say, yeah, the more stuff you stick in the environment, it's export actually on my system. I keep forgetting. It's not set. If I do export, it creates it, puts it into the environment, which is kind of weird actually. The wording is kind of odd, but um, set it also has the system variables, essentially, for the shell that work in the shell. Uh, but long story short, you know, um, they used to say, "Oh, it adds overhead." Well, it sort of does. It takes up your user memory. You put a lot of environment variables out there. You might notice a little lag. Maybe not. You'll never notice it. It's not, it's not significant. It's not significant enough not to use it as a technique. So. Conditionals. You can do this. You can say, if condition, then, you know, zero, condition is zero. You know, true is equal to zero or something. You know, or, you know, execute all. And then commands up to the else statement. And then else, if this condition is not true, then execute all. And commands up to the if. That's a, that's a backwards. <laughs> but anyway, long story short, uh, you can actually put conditionals in there. In fact, you can do, like, uh, Anything you could possibly do in a programming language, you can pretty much do in a shell. And if you don't like that, then you pick a shell script. You, you pick up a Perl. You pick up one of these other languages, and voila, you've got other stuff to it. So usually somebody at this point will ask me a question. So why use Perl, then, if you can program in C? You can do all this other stuff. Well, automation is the trick. And Perl has what's called reusable loadable modules <laughs> and you have loadable modules that you can do encryption with and you can do encoding. In fact there's a there's a Perl library that takes uh, .mov files and turns them into uh, mp4 files and wave files and turns them into mp3 files and stuff you know to and it's a Perl module and so what ended up happening in the beginning is Perl's been around for years. I mean, it's like one of the original Unix scripting languages. So, long story short, there's like a utility for everything written in Perl. You don't even have to think about it. It's going to be included. There's a loadable module for it. And then people are still loading. People are still creating Perl <coughs> modules. Um, and we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a couple weeks, or a couple weeks, this, we'll have a couple of uh, lectures. I keep thinking this is a weekday class, but uh, it's a weekend class. We'll have a couple of lectures on Perl, and you'll sort of see the value in that. Here's performing loops as an example. You know, looping loops are statements. You know, obviously go over and over and over again. So, for this variable in this, so when you're writing your backup program, your scripts, so you can, yeah, did you back up the server? Yeah, sure, I did. 
you know, while you're sitting at home watching TV and the server's getting backed up, you know, just do a while loop or something, or you do a for loop for this, you know, do this kind of thing. I'm not going to spend too much time going through the syntax or even showing it to you because I'll save it for the, the looping lecture. I mean, I'll save it for the scripting lecture. But here, if I put it all together, and this is just, this isn't using anything. This is just using a shell. This is using bash. I just load up in this shell. And this is my first script. And I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do a replacement, actually. So remote file is going to be equal to this, and the server is going to be equal to that. And I'm going to SSH to the server. And I'm going to. You know, I'm going to redirect the output. I'm going to grab the air from that so I can find out if there is any air. If there is any air from the feedback, I'm going to write it to a standard air. Actually, I'm going to redirect is what I'm going to do. I'm going to use a pipe for it, too. And then I'm going to say, well, if it's missing, then you know, after I found out that if the air says missing file, uh oh, my backup failed. You know, so then I'm going to print something to the screen. And Echo, we have, you know, we've seen that already today. It's just putting something to the screen. Not found. Exiting. Okay. Else I'm going to SSH it. I'm going to cat it out to a remote file. And so I'm pretty much, this script is pretty powerful actually. It's taking and copying a file from a local to a remote and it's doing air checking on it. So it's checking the file content. So this could be uploading my, uh, this is finished actually. This is not a typo. It's finished. Um, this could be something, you know, that would uh, automate your script for your backup. A little bit more here, my ls info. You might add to it and say ssh my, and this is a system variable here. So this is basically taking a system variable, my server, which can be hard set to a server IP address. So you don't have to keep remembering the IP address, and then running an ls command on it and sending it out to a remote file. So, so back ticks. All right, back ticks. These guys here are used in place of the output from the command into the variable. So it's like not like a quote. It's used like, you know, substitute this environment variable for the value kind of thing. So if missing here in the quotes here, if is is this is missing it set, you know, does it have a value? Is it missing? If so, then the expression is true, otherwise it's false. So it's pretty powerful, as you can see. We can use values, we can use data, we can use variables, we can mix and match different things together. So, so the textbook for this course, heh, I told you before it was not, it's optional, actually. If you, if you want one, I recommend this one. It's still in print. It's, it's probably like $4 or something, or $5. And it's cheap, because it's really old. Uh, it's old, and then there's probably a million copies out there, and universities used to use it for years, and then Unix servers went away, <laughs> people went, and then cloud just came back, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, and now Linux skills and Unix skills are coming back, so, and we haven't really seen a surge of, of new books, so, you know, as, the Unix hasn't changed in years, which is why any Unix book out there is going to be useful for you, and I don't recommend any one of them, actually, in particular, so. So believe it or not, that was the end of lecture number one. And just in case I don't see some of you tomorrow, I want to spend a few minutes and go over uh, the assignments for this course. Uh, what I want to do is stop the video because I can break it out so you can tell which one. You don't have to listen to the whole video or fast forward through it. You can. I'll, I'll label the, the next one, I'll label it assignments. So this is the end of lecture number one. So let me stop this.